Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so the title was dreamed up by Austin. Um, I wouldn't have thought of it in this way, but it's reasonable to think about clinical trials in terms of the good, the bad, and the ugly. What I'm going to try to do is, is to take you through um, how you might think about randomized trials, why we do them, um, and if you are going to, you are mad enough to try to do them, then how would you set about it in, in an optimal way? So I think from the perspective of what is good, from my uh, point of view, and I think from the view of the clini clinical uh, practitioner, the good trial is the one where you ask an important question and you get a reliable answer. Um, because if you do that, then you're likely to change clinical practice. And that, after all, is the point of, uh, of embarking on such an exercise. Now, we've heard quite a bit this afternoon already about observational studies, um, and I just want to spend a few moments explaining why I think observational studies typically aren't a very good way of trying to estimate the effects of treatment. And the argument goes something like this. The the vast majority of drugs in clinical practice have only moderate effects on major outcomes. Obviously, if you've got an antihypertensive, then you can have a major effect on blood pressure and you don't really even have to do a randomized trial to detect that that is happening. But if you want to uh, look at the effects, say, of aspirin on mortality, then you can start off with the preconception that you're really only likely to have a very moderate effect on mortality. Um, Typically, drugs have an effect of, let's say, between 10 and 25 percent. And beyond that, it's really stretching credibility. So drugs that reduce risk of, say, mortality by 50 percent are extremely rare uh, and almost so rare as to be discounted. Now, if those reductions are rare, then you've got to plan your study to be able to detect such an effect, say, a 25 percent reduction or 20 percent reduction. And in order to be able to do that, um, you need to be able to eradicate the possibility that what you're measuring is either random error, or the play of chance, or a bias, or confounding. And the problem is that in most studies, you simply can't guarantee uh, that bias and confounding are small enough to be much smaller than the effect that you're trying to measure. So, for example, if you were trying to look at observational studies to detect uh, the effects of beta blockers uh, uh, on the risk of death after having a, had an MI, then if you were to look, and this is a paper published by uh, Steve McMahon and Rory Collins back in uh, 2001, they found examples of observational studies where the risk of death was 16% in the beta blocker group uh, and those who weren't taking a beta blocker had a risk of 30%. So you can see that if you use the observational study to estimate the effects of beta blockers, then you get, end up with an estimate of a 43% reduction in mortality. If, if, however, you look at the trial data, where you've eradicated the effects of uh, bias and confounding, then the estimate of effect is only 23%. So it's half the size uh, in the randomized studies as it is in the observational studies. So when you eradicate the effects of bias and confounding, you end up with something like the true effect, whereas you've overestimated by twofold the effect in the uh, observational studies. But it gets worse than that, because it's possible in observational studies to get the exact reverse of the correct answer. So, for example, here we're looking at the same study. Observational studies showed that antihypertensives actually increased, or appeared to increase the risk of uh, coronary heart disease event in these observational studies and the randomized studies of course showed us the real, the real answer which is you can reduce the risk of a coronary event by about one-fifth uh, if you randomize to an antihypertensive. So not only can you with observational studies get numerically incorrect answers but you can also get qualitatively incorrect answers and we had this problem in nephrology a bit back before Sharp some, some nephrologists believe that lowering cholesterol was bad for you, based on observational studies. And we've, we absolutely had to have randomized data to determine the truth, which is they're actually good for you. So this is to restate what I said earlier, that if you want to be able to detect effects 
of moderately effective treatments, aspirin, cholesterol lowering, antihypertensives, in my particular field, but it could be anti-cancer drugs in other fields, for example. Then you have to be able to make sure that the, uh, the systematic errors, the biases in your study, and the random errors, play of chance, are much, much smaller than the effect you're trying to measure. And if you've got a moderate benefit, that means that your errors and your, ran uh, your systematic and random errors have to be very small. And what that implies is you've got to randomise to get rid of the systematic errors, and you've got to have humongous numbers to get the random errors, the standard deviations, down to a really small size, that so they are much smaller and can be guaranteed to be much smaller than the effect you're trying to measure. So what you end up is the need for large-scale, randomised trials to detect effects of commonly used drugs in daily practice. So to give, uh, just to give you an example to start with from the context of cardiology, I'm afraid this is a bit small, but it doesn't really matter because what we're looking at here is uh, a meta-analysis of all the trials of fibrinolytic therapy, so thrombolytic therapy, streptokinase, alteplase, those types of drugs, um, before anyone really knew that they were any good in acute MI. So lots of trials have been done, and I don't know if you're familiar with these forest plots, but each line is a, is a trial, and the confidence interval is the, the horizontal line, and so small you can't see it. The point estimate is a little dot. You can see it better here. It was a bigger trial. And if you look at all the trials that were done, on average they sort of got the right answer, but they were scattered all over the place. And when you do a meta-analysis of all of them, you end up with this 22% estimated reduction in mortality when you give thrombolysis after acute MI. But of course that's no good to anyone because nobody really believes meta-analysis. You've got to have a single large-scale randomised trial for clinicians to change their clinical practice. So what was done was a large-scale randomised trial. Now, ISIS-2 was one of them. There was another one, GC-1, that went on at about the same time. So I'm just going to talk about ISIS-2 because it happened to have been run from Oxford. Now, what ISIS-2 did was it said, right, we've got to randomise, as it turns out, around about 20,000 patients to be able to guarantee that we can detect a one-fifth reduction in mortality. That's how the numbers work out. How, are we going to, how the hell are we going to randomise 20,000 patients? I mean, it really was a revolutionary idea in those days. And the answer is, you've got to get it really simple. It's got to be possible for busy doctors on the ward to randomise a patient almost as easily as they could clerk someone in. So it has to be dead easy. And it has to be inclusive. So as many people as possible coming through the, the door have to be randomisable. Because after all, we want the results of the trial to be relevant to as many of those people as possible. So keep it really simple. Just randomise anyone who's got suspected MI. And that was what was done. So it was really, really simple. In fact, I was a houseman when this was going on. Um, and I remember randomising patients. Although uh, later on when I joined the clinical <laughs> trial service unit, I never got any credit for that. So this is the form that we all filled in. Dead easy. To, to, literally five minutes. It was almost as quick to randomise as it was to clerk a patient in. Now, contrast that with what you now get typically when you're asked to get involved in a randomised trial. You get a, a lever arch file uh, and you have to spend your evenings filling in stuff retrospectively because you didn't measure it when the patient was there. That's not how to randomise large numbers. So the results were really very striking. And they're very famous, of course. We all know the results of ISIS-2. So what happened was we randomised 17,000 patients, and the patients allocated to placebo, this was two by two factorial design, so it was aspirin versus placebo and streptokinase versus placebo. Both patients got randomised to both things. If you've got aspirin or streptokinase, then it was about 10%. But if you've got both of them, then it was 8% dead after, after five weeks. Now, this was so clear these, the p-values for these comparisons were so small that this was totally accepted by the cardiological community overnight. And what happened was, from there being virtually no use of streptokinase early on in the process, in 86, almost overnight after ISIS-2 and also GC-1, 
there was a massive change in the use of streptokinase. So if you get clear results, and they really are incontrovertible, then clinical practice will change and it will change dramatically. And if we want treatment to be effective, what we've got to do is find effective treatments, make sure they're real, make sure they're safe, and then get them used as widely as possible. That's how to change public health outcomes. And that was what's happened. Now, if we look back now and think about all the other randomizations that have occurred in randomized trials in cardiology, uh, we've tested things like beta blockers and ACE inhibitors and so on. There's been a total revolution in care in cardiology. In fact, mortality after acute MI now is more than halved in, in my period in, clinical, in, in um, research practice. So it's really very dramatic what can be achieved by randomizing large numbers, getting clear answers, and then translating that into mass shifts in clinical practice. So how do you actually go about randomizing uh, large numbers of patients? How do you go about doing trials? That it turns out that the, trial, the art of doing trials is a lot more difficult than it looks, and it's become even more difficult since uh, the bureaucracy surrounding trials has become more onerous. But what I'm going to do now is just explain a little bit about what actually goes on in trying to think about how to, ran how to design randomized trials. Um, and it is, I suppose you could think of it as being a bit of an insider's view. Actually, it's trial and error over a long period of time. Even before I got involved, people were making mistakes by doing things in the wrong way and then learning from it. So hopefully this is a useful perspective, although it's very abbreviated. So let's start off by thinking about the study design. The first thing that it's got to make sure of is that you're asking a relevant question. There is absolutely no value in a clinical trial if no one's uncertain what to do. Um, if everybody, everybody believes you should be doing things in a certain way, then you'll never be able to randomise patients because no one will be interested in the study. And that might sound obvious, but you'd be amazed how many trials fail to recruit because there's no uncertainty. Everybody's doing things in the same way and they're not interested. So make sure there's uncertainty. Um, and then you need to make sure that there isn't something that's about to happen or could happen in the future that will completely torpedo your trial. So, for example, if the move is towards treating people with a certain drug, then it might be a bad time to start a trial of that drug because within a short time, everybody's going to be using it and no one's going to be interested in randomising into your trial. So do think about what might happen in the future. And I'll come back to an example of that in a moment. A lot of people, when they design studies, think, right, we've got to design a very narrow population because we want to keep control of what we're doing. But that's actually the reverse of what we've really needed. Because in clinical practice, what you actually want to do is to be able to treat as many of patients who are at risk of an event, uh, of an outcome, as possible. You want your trial to be as relevant to as many of your patients as possible. Because if the drug's effective, why not give it uh, really widely? So actually heterogeneity in a trial population is generally a strength. And it's also a lot easier to run trials if you're allowed to put as many of your patients in as possible. So wide exclusion criteria, sorry, wide inclusion criteria are generally uh, the best way to go. And minimization of exclusion criteria is a much better way to think about it. So typically when I see a list of exclusion criteria, that my first thought is, why is this one here? Why this one? What's wrong with having those patients in? Ask yourself the question. Often it's just because trials have always done it that way. It doesn't have to be like that. Think radically. Just rip it all up and start again. Think about how you would really do it if you were starting again. And you can choose your eligibility really using something that we've called the uncertainty principle. It's got nothing to do with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. It's actually all about just allowing people to put their patients into the trials if they are uncertain what to do. If they know they want to use one or other of the drugs, then of course they shouldn't be randomising. But if they're uncertain, and their patients are also uncertain, then it's reasonable to randomise. And that actually maximises all the different types of patients that you could possibly get into the trial. Because if one doctor's certain what to do, you can bet your bottom dollar that someone on the other side of the room will not be certain. They might even actually be certain you shouldn't put a patient on that treatment. So you get a wide variety of different views. Then you have to think about your study outcomes. 
Well, you want your outcomes to be relevant. So there wouldn't need to be major outcomes that have some relevance to the patient. You also want to make sure that they're potentially preventable by your treatment. It's no good studying uh, an outcome that's got no hope of being modified uh, by your drug. And I will again come back to that in a moment. It's got to be sufficiently frequent that it's feasible to do the study. Uh, obviously, if a, an event is very rare, then no study, however big, is going to be able to detect an effect of the drug on that outcome. And in general, uh, because event rates are falling in trials, we, in, we end up in a situation where we need to look at composite outcomes. So grouping different outcomes together, um, death or heart attack, um, stroke, heart attack or death, these are types of outcomes that we typically end up stud studying. And there's danger there that if you put outcomes together that are, are moving in an opposite direction, then you end up unable to detect a true effect of the drug. So if you look at, look to, for example, for aspirin, a bleed or an MI, they move in different directions and you end up finding no effect because you've moved in a different direction and got an aggregate of no effect. Um, I'm going to talk about total mortality a bit later, so I'll come back to that in a moment. But I'm going to give you now the example that uh, Professor Stack mentioned, the Sharp study, which we, we started actually a very long time ago now, 15 years ago, the work for that started. And we, the question we had was, we had all these observational studies that seemed to suggest that if you had low cholesterol uh, in, and you were on dialysis, then you were uh, really much more likely to die. And if you had higher cholesterol, which is supposedly bad for you, then you were less likely to die. This was the reverse of what we were thinking was really the case in the general population. And so there was massive uncertainty among nephrologists about how to manage cholesterol. Uh, should they give their patients a statin? And that was the question we were asking ourselves. Now, uh, we realized that we were going to have to do a very large study. Um, and I think it's fair to say that most people didn't think that it would need to be as big as we eventually made it, because they thought, well, these patients are really likely to die. You know, event rates are massive, so we don't need many patients. But actually, that isn't the right way to think about it, as I shall explain in a moment. So to make it really large, we aimed for about, about 10,000. Uh, we uh, kept our entry criteria very simple. So patients just had to have a history of chronic kidney disease. And the way we ensured that was we worked with nephrologists, because nephrologists look after patients with chronic kidney disease. And generally, if you haven't got chronic kidney disease, then you don't get to see a nephrologist. So we recruited through renal units. That was the first thing. And then we had very simple, simple entry criteria for men had to be, uh, their, kid, their um, creatinine has to be more than 150, women 130, and then, or they could be on dialysis. And it was as simple as that. We didn't mess around with measuring GFR or anything like that because we didn't need to. That was an unnecessary thing to do. We had to keep it simple. We then asked uh, our uh, recruiters to keep patients over 40 years of age because we wanted to have a high enough risk that the events would actually happen in these patients. And this is an example of future proofing. We excluded people with a history of MI or coronary revascularization. Why did we do that? Because the move at that time was for wider use of statins. And people who had a history of coronary heart disease were increasingly being treated with statins. And it was only a matter of time, we thought, before kidney patients who'd had a history of MI would get treated with statins. That was the way things were moving. And if that happened and they were in the trial, then that would tend to reduce the power of the study. So when people drop into treatment during the trial, they reduce the power of the study to detect an effect. So right from the very beginning, we agreed in the steering committee to exclude patients with a history of MI or coronary revascularization. Not everybody agreed with that in the steering committee. Some people were quite happy to randomise, but that's what we did. Now, uh, this looks a bit complicated, um, and I'm probably not going to describe it in great detail, but just essentially look at this. We had 9,500 patients, roughly, randomised, and we randomised them between two groups, mainly. The combination of azetamide and civastatin, that was the cholesterol-lowering group, and the placebo group. But we did also include, for one year, a three-way randomization. And we did that because some people said, well, 
if you randomise to a combination of azetamibe and simvastatin, and azetamibe is a, a, a cholesterol absorption inhibitor, uh, then if you have any problems in that group, you won't know whether it was the simvastatin that caused the, group, uh, the problem or the azetamibe. So to counter that, we did a three-way randomization to start with. So we, you know, if there were any problems in this group, we could say, well, if we compare with simvastatin alone, we can find out if it was azetamibe that caused it, and otherwise it'll be the simvastatin. In the end, there weren't any problems with azetamibe, and we didn't, really, we didn't, we didn't need to have done it, uh, but we did do it. What we didn't show in this trial, and we could never have shown in a million years, is whether adding azetamibe to simvastatin uh, adds benefit because there simply isn't enough power to do so and it wouldn't have been possible in nephrology to do that. Of course people want to know the answer to that but this trial couldn't address it. So the next question is what type of primary outcome should we have in this trial? And it turns out the question is more interesting than it looks. Okay you know that patients die from cardiovascular disease but it matters what type of cardiovascular disease patients die from if you're designing your trial. But when you look at the types of deaths from uh, cardiovascular disease in, in dialysis patients, the lower half, the colourful bit, is, is, is cardiovascular, but only the blue segment is actually acute MI. All the rest of it is sort of heterogeneous. It's cardiac arrest, arrhythmia, other cardiac causes of death. Patients often die suddenly. We don't know what the hell they're dying from. So what we had to plan for was the possibility that we'd only be able to prevent deaths within this very narrow group here. So I'm now going to show you a few slides that really outline our thinking on how we put together the composite outcome, the primary outcome. First of all, the evidence from all the statin trials suggested that on hemorrhagic stroke, statins are likely to increase the risk of hemorrhagic stroke. So we didn't want to include hemorrhagic stroke in our primary outcome cluster because it will always work against being able to detect any real benefits. You separate the benefits from the hazards, measure the benefits, measure the hazards, and then you can work out what to do. But don't mix them together. Then we figured out, from, or again from the statin trials that had already been done, that statins have absolutely no effect on arrhythmic death or on worsening heart failure. So these are two trials done uh, looking at statins in heart failure and these are the causes of death. You can see overall any death, no significant effect in this group of patients on any death and by far the most common causes of death were heart failure, uh, sudden rhythmic, worsening heart failure. So we could see from these two trials that if we included heart failure type outcomes, sudden death, arrhythmia, within our outcome then we would reduce the power of the study to detect any real benefits on atherosclerosis. Because statins prevent atherosclerosis. That's how they work. They don't have any effect on heart failure. And so that was our thinking. So our main outcome was going to be major atherosclerotic events. By that we meant major coronary event, occlusion of a coronary artery. It's a cholesterol-driven process. Non-hemorrhagic stroke, again, is a cholesterol-driven process, and we know from the other statin trials that that's effective. And any coronary revascularization, any, sorry, any revascularization procedure, coronary or non-coronary. So I'll pro I'm, sh I'm showing you now that the overall result, this is major atherosclerotic events. So by choosing our primary cluster, just those things that we thought cholesterol lowering would have an effect on, we increased the sensitivity of being able to detect something that was beneficial. It's not that we didn't want to measure the harms, we did. We just didn't want to mix them in with the benefits so that we could no longer see what the benefit was. We excluded people who had other cardiac causes of death or <coughs> hemorrhagic stroke. And so if we looked just at those two things, then there was no effect. It's sort of rationale for, for, for splitting them in that way. When you look at them all together, it's still beneficial, but the idea was there that you had to separate the benefits from the harms. I know people complain, now SHARP doesn't show any reduction in mortality. Well, SHARP could never have shown any reduction in mortality. And this shows you why. When we look at all the uh, different causes of death in all the randomised trials looking at statin therapy, this is the meta-analysis that was mentioned earlier, we've got all the trials of statin therapy, we've got all the individual data, and then we crunch the numbers. And what we've seen is that statins reduce the risk of cardiac causes of death, 
coronary more than other cardiac causes. They have an effect on ischemic stroke, but it doesn't have much of an effect on mortality, um, and then has no effect on non-vascular cause of death. So when, when you actually look at the numbers, using that information, you just reduce coronary mortality. Coronary mortality makes up a tiny fraction of deaths in sharp. In sharp. So when you look at our ability to look at things like, um, well, if you look at major atherosclerotic events, we obviously did detect an effect on that, so we had plenty of power there. Major coronary events, well, we had less power to do that because there just weren't enough of them. And when we look at vascular mortality, we'd have ni needed 94,000 patients to detect effects on va vascular mortality. And for total mortality, it shows you what a terrible outcome it is to, to, to think about using in your trials, even though everybody tells you you've got to have total mortality, we'd never have been able to do it. 240,000 patients would have been needed to detect an effect on total mortality. So don't listen to people when they tell you you need total mortality and there is an outcome. Think about it. Is it possible to detect it? If it isn't, there's no point in having it. It's not, not the case that a drug that doesn't reduce total mortality is useless. Ask a kidney patient whether they want to avoid a major atherosclerotic event. Do you want to have an MI? Uh, it can be avoided by uh, reducing the cholesterol. That is an effective treatment. So we then had to think about sample size. I'm rather losing track of time. I'm all right at the moment. Um, sample size estimation. OK, so most people calculate sample sizes by thinking, how many patients have I got? How many could I get? All right. Given that, what is my, what is my um, outcome? And then design an outcome that allows them to do the trial in their centre, because they've only got 50 patients. That's not the way to do trials. The way to do it is to think, what is a realistic estimate of my treatment effect? What is a worthwhile outcome to prevent? How many patients do I need using realistic estimates of error rates? What's your, what's your alpha and beta, you know, the, the p-values that you're going to use at the end of your trial? And then when you end up the answer 10,000, then you need to think about how you can bring together this collaboration to randomise 10,000 patients. Um, and that's why it's important to have collaboration in clinical medicine, because a lot of questions that really need to be answered must involve collaboration. They can't be done by individual centres or individual countries in many, in many cases. We could never have done SHARP in one country. So when you've got to the point of, you, random, uh, of, of having your trial designed, uh, then how are you going to recruit patients? A big mistake that is often made is to design really complex screening procedures. Now the process of finding patients, which I guess many of you have had to try and do to get patients into trials, uh, is often very frustrating because you end up finding your patients and then they go through the process of, of, have, of being screened and they're not eligible. And that's an enormous waste of time and resource. So the best way to do it is to try to, first of all, make as many patients eligible as possible so they're likely to be screened and go in, but also to pre-screen patients so that before they ever get to the screening appointment, you've got a pretty good idea whether or not they're eligible. So most patients going into a screening patient, uh, appointment should be recruitable. That's the way it should be set up. The other thing is that often, and it's typically a drug company thing, they want to have 25 countries because of their marketing requirements. But actually, running trials should be done in the most efficient way possible. So if you can randomise all your patients in one country, then why not do that? It's much more efficient. It's not absolutely necessary to have patients in 25 countries uh, to answer the question. Now, one thing you absolutely have to get right when you randomise patients is the randomisation procedure. Because if the randomisation procedure fails, you've just wasted all your time. It cannot be retrieved if, if the randomisation procedure failed. So, for example, here is a situation, and this is not the result of a trial, this is a graph showing you, over time, how many patients were allocated into two different randomised groups. And it was a one-to-one -one randomization. So you can see, over time, more patients were allocated into the first group and the second group. 
this is disaster. It can't be retrieved, um, and you might as well just tear the results up. It can't, no amount of clever statistics can really remedy the situation. It's just a disaster. And this is probably caused by people opening their envelopes and seeing what uh, their patient had allocated too quickly, uh, sealing it up again and putting it back into the, uh, into the pile and getting one that they want. Um, so randomization has to be done securely, using a computer preferably, to make sure that the allocated treatment is the one the patient actually gets offered. Do remember that, it's the bad. I've, I've only put one, the bad on one slide, and it's a really bad situation that's got to be avoided because it's such a waste of time and money. Now, compliance is important. Of course, there is non-compliance in trials. It's perfectly reasonable to expect that some patients will choose not to take their treatment or can't tolerate their treatment. But we can do some things, uh, but, but non-compliance does reduce the power of a study to detect an effect. And so, from our perspective, it's not helping us to, to, to discover whether treatments actually work. And that's the purpose of trials, to discover whether there's any effectiveness. We can work out how effective later on, but we've got to be able to detect it first of all. Now the first way you can do it is by having a run-in period. Now lots of people don't take their drugs because they just simply don't like taking drugs. And you don't want those types of patients in trials because they prevent you from being able to detect real effects. So during a run-in period when people are often given a placebo treatment to take, you can find out whether people are really committed to being in a trial, whether they're happy to carry on taking the trial drug long term. And if they're not, it's better that they're not involved. Better, better for them and better for you. And then in the trials, avoid allowing dropouts and drop-ins willy-nilly. Uh, so if a patient wants to drop out, why not talk to them about it? Why not understand the reasons why they want to do it? And often, if they've spoken to a doctor or to a nurse about it, they're happy to give it a go. They may have concerns that are completely unrelated to the drug. So it's really your job when you're running the trial to try and keep as many patients as possible on their allocated treatment. Then you've got to make sure that you capture all the outcomes. So, and you do that in an unbiased way. So it's no good, for example, treating one group differently to the other. Everybody's got to have their outcomes ascertained in the same way. And you've got to make sure you don't lose patients. And a lot of effort now goes into trials making sure that we remain in contact with the patient, we know is what is happening with them all the time, and we don't just accept it if they stop contacting us or we can't get a hold of them. We, we, we have multiple efforts to get in touch with them. I'm not gonna do that. Right, so the next thing I want to talk about is monitoring, because monitoring is an enormous sink of time and money in trials. And this is the process where, by which we send individuals to a trial site to work out whether the trial is being done properly. And typically what happens is the monitor pitches up, things haven't been done properly, so they spend the next two days filling in the forms as they should have been filled in. And that is not, we believe, the purpose of monitoring. Monitoring begins with proper training of the trial personnel. And training should be seen as a support mechanism to make sure that the trials can be done properly by the nurses or by the trial personnel, whoever, uh, is recruited to do it. And it's a, it's, a, it's a joint effort between the coordinators and the trial personnel to design systems, first of all, that allow patients to be recruited reliably and followed up reliably and easily, efficiently. And it's something that we spend a lot of time doing now in Oxford to try to make it possible for trials to run smoothly by design. We design trials in a way that that is easy. And we don't send monitors to sites in general. Uh, we do a little bit, but in general, it's when we identify that there are problems. So we, we engage in something called statistical monitoring of data, where we actually look at what is recorded, and it might be difficult for you to see this, but by recording all the data electronically, we have real-time information <coughs> about, for each site, and this is an example of a trial that happened to be the Thrive trial, where for each point is a site, and the outliers are in colour. So on SAE reporting, we had some outliers in these colours. Visit duration, because we had an electronic recapture system, we had the time stamp of when the patient came in and when they went out. So we could tell if somebody only took two minutes to see their patient, that was something we could detect. Or if they took three hours to see their patient, we could see that too. 
And so by having these different dimensions of quality, we were able to send our monitors just to those sites where there are problems. And we don't send them as a sort of uh, punishment, we send them as a way of supporting the sites to help them to do the study properly. And then we have a very important uh, factor in randomised trials, and that is making sure that there are no post-randomisation withdrawals. That is absolutely deadly for, for, for study power. If you have people withdrawing from the studies, you kill the study power. So these different ways uh, of avoiding it, just keeping it very simple, only recording key study outcomes, reducing the work for the, the, the site personnel. Um, we don't collect blood in everybody. We don't need to. If you've got a 10,000 patient study and you want to detect the cholesterol difference between 5,000 allocated statin and 5,000 allocated placebo, you don't need all, all 10,000 to do bloods. You only need a couple of hundred. So why do blood in everyone? You don't need to. It's expensive and it's time for the staff. So just do it in a random subset. So these are ways in which you can think about how to do the study more efficiently and keep the costs down. And then you can use health record systems. In countries where we've got centralised health record systems, they can be used to collect data. Uh, and they're a, often a more efficient way of collecting data than asking the study personnel to do it. So then we get to the point of um, reporting the study, and I'm just going to really talk about one thing, because one thing causes more trouble than anything else put together. And that is subgroup analysis. And when you're in the lucky position of being able to write up your paper, there'll be loads of uh, people who, who want you to do various subgroups because it's mechanistically interesting. Now, you saw this power calculation for Sharp. Uh, even with 9,500 patients, we, we had adequate but not great power to detect the main study result. We did not have power to look at lots of subgroup analyses. Subgroup analyses may be unreliable. So to, to convince you of that, I'm showing you a very famous subgroup analysis that was done when we wrote up the ISIS-2 study. So I showed you this earlier. You saw a very clear result, aspirin versus placebo. So that's the overall result, uh, 800 versus 1,000. That's the p-value. Everybody very convinced that aspirin reduces vascular mortality. But the Lancet, the story goes, the Lancet editor, when he saw this paper, said, I just want you to do some more subgroup analyses. And the authors said, well, actually, there isn't, even with this result, there isn't a great power to look at subgroups. Uh, and eventually, the authors being who they were, agreed with the Lancet editor, well, we'll just add one more subgroup, but we're not going to tell you what it is. So you can go to the paper and you can see this. They did a subgroup by trawling through all the star signs of all their patients, and they detected that actually, if you were born under Gemini or Libra, then aspirin was not beneficial. And this was done by just looking at different combinations. Okay? And you can see, even though it's a sort of whimsical example, you can see how you can generate apparently meaningful findings from meaningless results. And although that's a sort of frivolous example, there are examples in the literature, many, many examples, I'll show a few now, where similar things were taken as real because some people had a theory that it might be the case. And unfortunately, what happens is it turns into clinical practice, and it's rubbish. It's just garbage. So here's an example. The GC2 trial showed that there was no apparent effect in people who had no previous MI of treating with thrombolysis. But later on, when the ISIS-2, you know, a few months later, when the ISIS-2 study reported, it showed that the truth was that there was a benefit in people with no previous MI. So, Luckily, there was a second study that showed that this first study was wrong. But this is this an example of a subgroup. It seems perfectly reasonable as a subgroup, but it is a subgroup. And unless it's been pre-specified, and there's only one of a few that have been pre-specified, it's liable to generate nonsense. Here's another one. And this one did result in uh, regulatory action. This is the PLATO trial, uh, looking at um, Decabulol versus Clopidogrel. Overall, the result was very clear, 9.8% versus 11.7%, but it appeared not to be effective uh, in North America. So did the FDA like that? Not particularly. But this is a nonsense analysis. There's no reason to think that this would be, no reason to pre-specify that you'd expect it to be ineffective in North America. 
So these types of subgroup analyses are enormously damaging. Sorry to go on about it, but it's so important to make sure that we don't end up harming patients by excluding some who would really truly benefit. Um, I'm not going to do this, it's just a bit mathematical, um, and I'm probably running short of time. So uh, I think it's very important that we do avoid uh, on-treatment analyses as well. Uh, this is where you just look at the patients who actually got the treatment. It's a non-randomised analysis, and again, it's something that causes damage to patients because it results in misleading findings. And here's an example uh, of where you just look at people who complied. Now, if you look people here allocated to clofibrate in the coronary drug project, you can see that good compliers did much better than the poor compliers. So this must be an effect, surely, of complying with treatment. Well, actually, no, because you see the same for placebo. 15% taking placebo did well, 28.3% uh, on uh, who were poor compliers. So this is a very good example of bias when you do the analyses in a non-randomised fashion. I've got to finish with the ugly. I struggled a bit with this because of the title that uh, Professor Stack gave me. I knew I had to, had to find something ugly about clinical trials, and I, I found this. This was uh, a title of a paper just recently published, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly Red Tape of Biomedical Research. I'm not going to talk about this, but be aware that red tape is killing clinical trials. And it's much more difficult now than it was when I was 20 years younger, when we were first starting out in research, to do really high quality trials. Because the red tape surrounding clinical trials has become ridiculous. And it's preventing us from finding treatments that really benefit our patients. So that's my summary. I'm very happy to answer questions if there's any time. And thank you very much for listening.